area of the church. Then you have a line of pillars to hold the roof up. Uh, and people sit in these sections uh, uh, as the, the leadership does whatever they do up at uh, the altar area. Uh, this particular one is the one at Kersey that I said yesterday I took this group to and we, we stood right about here and recited together the Apostles' Creed uh, in this ancient church uh, just east of Galilee. Churches began to be more elaborate, um, particularly the cruciform church, which is in the shape of the cross. So churches began to be built so that if you looked at them from the top, they're kind of built this way. The entrance to the church is here. This is the nave. These are the transepts. And this is the apse. Where's the altar area? In the really big cathedrals, right along here, there will be rows for choir, which do antiphony. We talked about antiphony. Okay. And then the altar will be back here. Often the pulpit is going to be somewhere like around here. Uh, so that people sitting here or here or here all can view the pastor as he preaches from from this uh, usually kind of a raised area, uh, 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 kind of a little cubicle, so to speak, uh, where he preaches from. If you go to London and go to someone that's like, um, uh, you know, one of the big churches, St. Paul's or, or Westminster uh, uh, Abbey or something like that, you'll see it set up like this. They also begin to build churches higher, and some of them really higher, because of the development of what were called flying buttresses, these sections that were built out to the side that reinforced the wall so that it wouldn't fall down. And so you can go into some of the old cathedral churches and, boy, when you look up, it's like, wow, it's a long ways up there, you know. Uh, it, it really gives you a, a feeling of majesty, if nothing else, uh, these, these ancient uh, cathedrals. There's uh, one of the biggest I've ever been in uh, actually is the one in Trondheim in Norway. Uh, there's a huge cathedral. There's also a really big one in Liverpool. If you get on the top of the roof in Liverpool, you can actually see Ireland uh, from England, uh, at least if it's not too cloudy. Uh, uh, but anyway, you have Notre Dame in Paris. You know, you've got a lot of these big cathedrals that are, that are sometimes built over the process of three or four hundred years. I mean, when you get into church building project in the medieval period, you're in for the long haul. Because these are, these are big structures and they take a long time to complete. Well, that's enough for the medieval period. I'm going to call that a wrap for the first session. Let's take our longer break and then we're going to come back and look at the Reformation and what happened there. We're still having uh, lunch today at noon. Yeah. Okay. And you uh, are, are they eating in the cafeteria?
as we're gathering in, as the saints are um, are slouching in. <laughs> So let me ask you, are just this uh, last um, uh, couple of hours and what we did yesterday, do you have at least a, a little bit of a feel for what was happening in the, you know, roughly the first thousand years or so of Christianity, at least better than you had before? I'm hoping you this has been helpful and um, uh, kind of... Uh, you, you get a sense that we didn't just arrive here from the planet Mars. We, we actually came through a pathway of history uh, with a lot of things that went before us that explains some of the things that we still have with us today, actually, uh, have roots in, in these kinds of areas. So now we want to come to the issues and leaders of the, of the Protestant Reformation, which is the third big major division in Christianity. Two concerns. One is what I would call the evangelical concern, which is the concern for the gospel. There's only one gospel. Paul says there's only one way. Anybody that preaches any other way is to be condemned. You can't be preaching another Jesus. You have to be preaching the Jesus that the apostles preached. Okay, so this is the evangelical concern. And there's also the Catholic concern. The universal concern. This not, I'm not talking here about the Roman Catholic concern, but the, 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 the idea of the church being universal. Where the concern is the unity of the church. Only one church and all who are baptized into Christ are part of that church. So this concern, the evangelical concern for the purity of the gospel, has to make difficult decisions where people are not preaching the gospel and saying, okay, you aren't really part of the true church. On the other hand, there is this concern for unity expressed in Jesus' prayer when he says, Father, may they be one as you and I are one. Ideally, both of these concerns should be working together. But in the Reformation, they came into significant tension with each other, which I think you could say is the fundamental cause of the Reformation itself, is that these two things these two ideal, ideals were in tension with each other. Some of the hallmarks of the Reformation, there are four, especially, that all begin with the Latin word sola, which means alone. What is the sufficient divine agent of salvation for the Protestant reformers that's going to be grace alone? What is the sufficient human response for salvation? It is going to be faith alone. Sola gracia, sola fide. Who is the sufficient source of salvation? They're going to say Christ alone, solus Christus. And what is the sufficient authority for the Christian life? It will be scripture alone, sola scriptura. These four themes are the ones that drive the Reformation. And in a sense, you could almost capsulize everything that happens uh, as issues concerning these four uh, solas, if you will. Now, Protestant and Roman Catholic differences in several ways. Roman Catholic theology is a both-and theology, while Protestant theology is usually an either-or theology. And let me show you what I mean by that. When it comes to salvation and mediation, by mediation I mean my relationship to God as a Christian, for Roman Catholics, it's Christ and Mary. For Protestants, it's Christ or Mary, but not both. And for them, it's Christ. It's Christ and not Mary, I guess you could say. Uh, so who is the source of divine grace? It's Christ alone. In um, Roman Catholic theology, of course, there is the idea that Mary is herself a source of grace. This is the reason that the basic prayer that's often prayed in the rosary um, uh, about Mary, uh, 
um, which says that she is full of grace. Now that's a quotation from the passage uh, in the Nativity uh, of Luke's Gospel. But um, in the Roman Catholic thinking, when it says um, uh, she is full of grace, it means that she is able to dispense grace. Whereas full of grace in the Protestant viewpoint is that Mary is just a person who has been blessed by grace, but she doesn't have the ability to give grace. So you see the difference between both and as opposed to either or. Does that make sense what I'm saying? The same is going to be true of faith and works. For Protestants, it's going to be faith alone. For Roman Catholics, it's going to be both faith and works. What or how uh, does God save us? Uh, divine grace versus human initiative. For Protestants, it's going to be grace alone. For the Roman Catholic Church, it's going to be both grace and human initiative. And to whom can you pray? For Protestants, it is Christ alone. For Catholics, it is both Christ and the saints. Now, from the Catholic position, the way this is explained is simply this. Do you ask other people to pray for you? Now? Yes. Yeah. I mean, if there's one thing I see in YWAM, it's that. <laughs> okay? So, if there is only one church composed of both the living and the dead who belong to that same church, because God is not the God of the dead, He's the God of the living, even those who have died to us are alive to God, why would you not ask Peter to pray for you? It's not so easy to answer when it's put that way, is it? <clears throat> um, but nonetheless, uh, there would be a, a both and either or kind of thing. For, for Protestants, Christ is alone the mediator between God and man. For Roman Catholics, it is appropriate to pray to saints as part of the Christian community. Then there's the idea of spiritual authority, who has authority to confirm salvation. For Protestants, it is Christ alone. For the Catholic Church, it is both Christ and the Church who has authority to confirm salvation. And about Scripture and tradition, the same. For Protestants, Scripture alone. For Catholics, both Scripture and tradition. <clears throat> so we have a number of Reformers that started kind of early. They're earlier than Luther. And they're not really, they're kind of like... Um, they're not, they're not full-blown reformers because it doesn't actually happen yet, but they're, they're on that track, if you will, maybe a hundred years early. One of them is John Wycliffe, uh, who's an Englishman, <clears throat> a professor at Oxford University. And he begins to criticize some of the prevalent views of the authority of the church. And he argues that the true church is really the congregation of those chosen by God, not those whom church uh, leaders have approved. Okay? Um, he's going to argue that the basic law of the church should be the Bible, not the word of the Pope in Rome. And he's going to argue that the church is full of wealth, it's full of corruption. Why would we want to say that it, is, it has authority if it's full of all these very uh, unpleasant things? And... He says the Bible really ought to be translated into the common language of the people. Well, that's never done, been done yet uh, in, in the medieval period. The church uh, liturgy, what is the language that's used in the West? Latin. It doesn't matter whether you're in Germany, in England, in Holland, or somewhere else. The, the church service is still going to be in Latin. And you're there basically to be there even though you can't understand it. Okay, so it's a, it's, and Wycliffe sees, says, that's crazy. The, the, the Bible needs to be in the language of the people. And so he begins to translate it. He doesn't know Greek, but he translates it from Latin into a form of English. Then in Bohemia, in what today is the Czech Republic, um, there is a man by the name of Jan Hus, uh, who is a priest. And he has some of the same ideas, very similar to Wycliffe. One of the things he said, how can church clergy use the offering to pay for prostitutes? There's got to be something wrong here. And I, would you agree? I mean, I, I think you would. I hope you would. Okay. 
the church itself is the elect, chosen by Christ. That's very similar to what Wycliffe is going to be saying in England. Christ, not the Pope, is the true head of the church. Christ alone can forgive sins. The Pope should not be venerated. Only Christ should be venerated. Now, these early rumblings in England and uh, what today is Czechoslovakia, venerated. venerated means honored as sort of the highest uh, level of spirituality and authority. Okay? The, uh, the Roman uh, uh, Pope is believed to be the vicar of Christ. He is the actual voice of Christ to the church. And it's related to that. <clears throat> so Wycliffe managed to survive until he's old. <clears throat> but even after he died, uh, later they're going to dig up his bones and burn his bones, just sort of symbolically that he's under disapproval. Jan Hus is going to be burned alive. Uh, he's going to be taken to the Council of Constance. He was guaranteed safe conduct by the church. And the church, no better way to say it, they just lied. Once they got him there, they put him in jail and they burned him alive. Um, so he paid for his wild ideas uh, in the maximum way. This is Wycliffe's version. Um, I don't have this in the PowerPoint you have because I had more time. I added a few uh, other slides and this is one of the ones I added. But you can, you can look at this early form of English. This is the beginning of the book of Acts uh, in Wycliffe's version. See if you can look at it and sort of make it out, the beginning of the book of Acts. That, that is English, by the way. It's not the, quite the form of English you're used to. Yeah? By the Holy Ghost. <laughs> yeah, you did, you did really good. Yeah. You, you can make it out. But it's a little bit of a slow read because the spellings are rather different than you're used to and uh, so on. Um, so anyway, Wycliffe's version uh, was, was, uh, was done. Uh, many of the copies were confiscated and burned, however, because what he was doing was not with approval of the church. What really kicks off the Reformation, however, is this guy here, Martin Luther. This is a painting of Luther by uh, Cranach. Um, uh, and Luther is himself a priest in the Catholic Church. He studied law at the University of Erfurt. Eventually he joined the Augustinian order of monks. Uh, he fulfilled a vow. He was caught in a thunder and lightning storm and he promised God that if I get out of this alive I'll be a monk. So um, much to the displeasure of his father who wanted him to be a lawyer, he went into the monastery. And he was ordained in 1507, and he taught at the University of Wittenberg. He became a doctor of theology in 1512. Uh, probably not a lot older than most of you, really. He was pretty young when this happens. And then in 1517, he posts his famous 95 theses on the eve of All Saints' Day on the doors of the Wittenberg Church. Now, what in the world are theses? You've all heard of 95 Theses, but what are they? They're arguments. They're basically invitations to debate. Now, sometimes in films, you see people, you know, they, there's been a few films of Luther and people running up to the door and reading these things. They weren't running up the door and reading them. It was all in Latin. They didn't read Latin. Uh, the 95 Theses were not written in common language. They were written in Latin. They were invitations to debate by doctors of theology. However, a technological innovation had happened not that long before Luther, and that technological innovation made his theses widely known. And that innovation was the printing press. Luther's theses in Latin were quickly translated into German, printed, and leaflets started flooding Germany and people are reading, whoa, whoa, look at that, look at what he says here, whoa. And man, they're just going nuts because he's, Luther is not, uh, he's not a person of finesse. He's more like a bulldozer, you know. Uh, and he just 
comes down in very blunt language. I mean, he says things like this. If, if all of the uh, mercy of Christ resides in the Pope, why doesn't he just go to the hospitals and empty them out? Um, I mean, you know, he's, he's really um, fiery uh, in the way that he expresses this. And he has made what he believes to be an absolutely critical discovery. He's begun translating the Bible into German already. And he is running into the passage in Romans 1, verses 17 and 18, where it talks about the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, from first to last. Now, the medieval theologians had always taught that the righteousness of God is God's righteous anger against sinners. Luther reads this, and in connection with the rest of the letter to the Romans, and says, this is not about God's righteous anger against sinners. This is about God's righteous gift to sinners of His own righteousness. And that's why it is from faith to faith, and from first to last. And so, Luther's discovery in Romans is that righteousness does not refer to God's condemnation, but rather his free gift of righteousness to anyone who will believe in the work of the cross. Well, that was revolutionary. I mean, that just changed all kinds of things and the way people thought about things. So Luther is teaching here at Wittenberg University, which actually still exists. Uh, um, that building is, in fact, the building that Luther taught in. Um, this is the door, not the original door, but this is the door of the Wittenberg church where he nailed his 95 thesis. The problem is, for the last 500 years, people have been taking chunks out of this door, so there's no door left. They had to put new doors on here uh, because of people taking souvenirs. But theoretically, at least, this is the door where he nailed up his 95 theses. Uh, and you can see it today if you happen to get there in Germany. Now, one of the issues that is coming up that really uh, becomes uh, a major issue with Luther is what are called indulgences. Now, this is a particular theology within the Roman church. The church taught that there was a treasury of merits in which a lot of really good things have been stored up by people who actually didn't need them. You've got Saint somebody here... Uh, whoever he is, he's got all kinds of good works. He's got more than he needs. He only needs this many good works to go to heaven. But he's got lots extra. Well, what do you do with that? Well, that all gets to go into a treasury that can be drawn upon by others. This is called an indulgence. And how do you get a hold of this extra stuff? Yeah, just like you said. Dollars. You buy an indulgence, a slip of paper for so much money that says you get this extra merit and you can apply it to your mother who's in purgatory. She's dead, but she's in purgatory. And you can get her out early. So who would let their mother suffer in purgatory when for just a few dollars you can get her out? Well, the guy that's selling these things is selling them right across the river from Martin Luther's parish church. And some of his parish members are going over and buying this stuff. He found one of his members who was drunk as a skunk and says, what are you doing? And the guy shows him this piece of paper. He says, I got this, you know. He said, this not only covers my past sins, this covers my future ones. Now, who wouldn't want a document like that? You know, I mean, how good can you get? Uh, Luther is absolutely incensed. So, um, there's also the fact that St. Peter's Basilica in Rome is being built, and the sale of indulgences is one of the primary means of raising funds. Christians usually have cr creative ways of raising funds. Even YWAM, there are creative ways of raising funds, but I don't think they've ever resorted to indulgences. Um, not yet. Um. <laughs> okay. No, I don't think they ever will. <clears throat> so, his 95 Theses is a debate about this stuff. 
And it's aimed at the sale of indulgences, particularly against the Pope's salesman by the name of John Tetzel. Tetzel is, a, is an aggressive salesman who is selling indulgences. He has a nice little jingle that basically translates like this. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. So <clears throat> who would have his mother suffer in purgatory when for a few dollars you can get her out? For Luther, this undermines the gospel itself. And so he is furious about this. And he begins to talk about it publicly, not only in the 95 Theses, but in his sermons, uh, in other writings. He's writing uh, things with uh, uh, curious titles like the Babylonian Captivity of the Church, <laughs> which you don't even have to read it. You know it's going to be bad news. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> anyway, eventually, he is going to be taken to Worms, uh, where he is going to under undergo a theological examination and trial by the doctors of the church. And he is presented with his writings. He's got quite a lot of his writings. They're all declared to be her her heresy. And the examiner is going to tell him, you must recant all of your writings. And Luther responds and says, well, how can I recant them all? Some of them are quotations from the Bible. You don't want me to recant that, do you? <laughs> And some of them are quotations from the church fathers whom you revere. You don't want me to recant that, do you? So he's, he's, he's in the debating game with them, you know. But eventually they're going to give him a certain period of time and say, either recant or, you know, your, your life is over, basically. And he comes back and finally in his final speech, this is what he says. And by the way, the, the, the prince of his German region, the German Germany at, at that time is a bunch of small states, kind of, and so the prince is there. So he says, your imperial majesty, your lordships demand a simple answer. Here it is, plain and unvarnished. Unless I am convicted of error by the testimony of scripture or by manifest reasoning, I stand convicted by the scriptures to which I have appealed, and my conscience is taken captive by God's word. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to act against our conscience is neither safe for us nor open to us. On this I take my stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. When you say that to a group of people that can kill you, and they're going to try. Um, you, you're, you're taking a pretty courageous position. Uh, Luther had been guaranteed safe conduct, but he was spirited away to the Wartburg Castle in nor northern Germany, which is that's still there as well. This is where Luther, while he was in sort of exile, if you will, from the authorities, worked on his translation of the Bible into German, both the New Testament and then the Old Testament. And so he, for quite a period of time, is secluded and out of the reach of the authorities that were in the, sort of the main areas of Germany and protected by uh, uh, a friend of his who was the local uh, ruler of that area of Germany. So he's going to be up there for a while. He produces a translation of the scriptures in German. So since he's been, been called the grandfather of all German editions of the Bible, if you are German and you read the German Bible, the German Bible you read today is simply a sort of modernized version of what Luther did half a millennia, millennium ago. In fact, I had a really interesting conversation um, some years ago with a missionary who was uh, a very committed King James Version only kind of person. And he was going to go to Germany as a missionary. And he was wondering where he could get a copy of the German King James Version. And I started laughing at him. What are you laughing at? I said, well, it doesn't exist. What do you mean it doesn't exist? I said, the King James Version is an English version. It's not German. There's no German King James Version. He said, well, what am I going to use? I said, you're going to use Luther's Bible. Oh, no. I can't. He, he wasn't Lutheran, so he didn't think he could do that. You know, he was in this horrible dilemma. What is he going to do for a Bible, you know? Uh, trying to find a King James Version in German. Well, anyway, I guess it takes all kinds to make up the church. Uh, 
Luther does translate the New Testament from Greek to German in two and a half months. Just about the time we're going to take to do the Greek course in January, February, and March. Boy, wasn't that cool how I weaseled that in there? Too? It sounds like I had a salesman call me once and said, Mr. Lewis, I have, a, I have a set of volumes that you really need. It's how to master the Bible. I said, oh, I've already mastered it. He didn't know what to say. <laughs> I mean, that was arrogant on my part, I agree, but still, I didn't really want to talk to him for a bit. <laughs> So he completes the Old Testament. Now it takes him a little bit longer, about 10 years to do the Old Testament. Uh, Luther's got to actually learn Hebrew uh, and then work on the Old Testament. Of course, that's long. But the first German Bible appears at Wittenberg in 1534. This is a printed edition of the German Bible. It looks like this. This is uh, one of the first edition, a, a photo of one of the first edition copies in 1534. Actually, kind of like, uh, like the Good News version. It has some nice pictures in it, you know, woodcuts uh, at various places. Uh, now, in all of this, there's an interplay between uh, the whole idea of authority. In the Eastern Church, there is kind of a double source of authority. There is holy oral tradition, and there is holy written scripture. And they stand as, as essentially side by side as the authority for Christians. In Roman Catholicism, there's a double source. There is the infallible Christian tradition of the church and inspired scripture. But uh, for Luther and the Protestants, there is one single source and that is scripture alone, sola scriptura. And while Christian tradition is important, it is always under scripture, not side by side with scripture. So this is going to be a different way of thinking for those who are going through the Protestant Reformation than was typical for the last thousand years or so of the church. Now, <clears throat> in England, in 1408, the English Parliament passed laws that forbade translating or even reading any part of the Bible in English. You could be prosecuted for reading the Bible in English or for saying things that belong to the church in English. You had to have express permission from church authorities to do that. This was actually passed by Parliament. That, pardon me? I mean saying anything from the church. Like the Apostles' Creed. If you got caught saying the Apostles' Creed in English, you could be executed. If you were heard saying the Lord's Prayer in English, you could be executed. Pardon? By whom? Executed. By the government. Not by church. Not well. I mean, kind of the church and the government are pretty much together at this point. So it's a little hard to say which is which, but... Uh, either or both um, there were some executions that actually happened along those lines people were burned at the stake for teaching their children the Apostles Creed and the Lord's Prayer in English or the Ten Commandments in English um, that's, that's a pretty harsh position but you have to understand they're trying to hold the line and what they felt like was a, a really important issue and that that is the church that has control of spiritual elements. You can't just leave that to anybody to do what they want with them. Because they were teaching it in Latin, right? In the church they were teaching it in Latin, but there were these wild-eyed Englishmen that decided, well, we'd like to do this with our kids in English. So they were translating this stuff yeah. into English. But it wasn't originally, like, it wasn't Greek, it wasn't... No, th these aren't professional translations. These are are actually translations of a translation. Yeah, but the, the Latin, why did they think that the Latin was like so holy in comparison to other churches? Because the Latin Bible had been the Bible of the church for a thousand years, going back to Jerome. In many ways, their view of the Latin Bible was a lot like people's King James Version view of the English Bible. Uh, they felt like it was the, it was the, 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 the language God wanted. In fact, I've actually heard people say, you know, crazy things like 
if the King James Version was good enough for St. Paul, it's good enough for me. <laughs> I know of somebody that said, when in doubt, throw the Greek out. What? Oh, yeah. You, I mean, that's in Protestants. So, you know, you can't blame it all on the Catholics. Okay, so... Um, uh, this was a way of holding the line for who holds the authority of the church. And you can't be giving that up. Nevertheless, Greek scholarship is moving westward. And especially after the storming of Constantinople, many people who knew Greek and the Greek Bible were coming westward into Europe and Britain and bringing with them Greek texts of the Bible. And the printing press is now available, so it's actually possible to publish the Greek Bible. And so you have wild guys like William Tindu who says, I think we need to do this in English for everybody. In fact, he says this to the Bishop of London. The Bishop of London, uh, he had gone to the Bishop of London to ask for permission to begin translating the Bible into English. And the Bishop uh, waffles on this, says, well, I'm not going to give you permission. So Tyndale responds by saying, if God spares my life, ere many years pass, I will cause a boy that drives the plow will know more of the scripture than you do. <laughs> Well, that's a pretty, you know, gutsy uh, response. Uh, but he goes about that, and he begins translating the Bible into English from Greek and Hebrew. Now, Tyndale was a bona fide scholar in Greek and Hebrew. So unlike Wycliffe, who was only able to translate from Latin, Tyndale actually has copies of the Hebrew Bible and copies of the Greek New Testament. What was the Eastern Church? What, what language were they speaking? mostly Greek in the churches. The liturgy was largely still in Greek, and the texts were still largely in Greek. So my question is kind of similar to that. Then the texts that uh, would have been translated from in the Greek into English, that Tyndale used... It's primarily the Byzantine text. Okay, so it's been similar to what the Eastern... What the Eastern Church has been using. That's exactly right. It's primarily Byzantine texts that are from the Eastern Church. At this point, they've not discovered things like Codex Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, all those kind of older manuscripts, the papyri. They're using the lectionaries and texts in Greek that are used by the Greek church. Yep. Yep. Which is why in some places later you have these textual variations where modern scholars say, well, earlier versions don't actually say that, but the Byzantine text actually did say that. So you get into those kinds of issues. This is uh, a page from uh, Tyndale's 1936 version, which was printed in Antwerp, which is not in England. Uh, Tyndale had to leave England because it's just too hot. I mean, he wouldn't survive. So he went to, uh, to uh, the lowlands, basically, where there were some rather liberal printers that would print his emerging Bible in English. And then he shipped them back to England in bags of grain in, uh, in uh, you know, uh, commercial vessels. And so they would hide these copies of the New Testament in feed sacks and stuff like that. And somebody in England who was sort of into the loop would extricate those out and then they would sell those. And then the church, because they were trying to get rid of them, would buy them up and destroy them. But when they bought them up, all the money went back to Tyndale in the lowlands to print more. So even though they didn't, didn't probably want to, they were actually financing him without entirely realizing it. Anyway, this is a page. This is a, a, kind of like the other one. This is the beginning, actually, of Luke's gospel uh, and the way that it reads in this level of the English language. You want to try this one? For as much as many have taken in and copied, uh, copied treats of the things which are surely known among us, <laughs> even as they declare them unto us, which from the beginning saw them there themselves, saw them themselves and were ministers at the do. I determined also uh, something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you can work it all out. Um, it is different, obviously. The spellings are different in, in this form of Middle English and so on. Um, but anyway, uh, Tyndale is finally caught. Um, the, authority, the church authorities in England actually hired a spy 
to infiltrate Tyndale's friends and uh, betrayed him. He was arrested, he was imprisoned, and eventually he was choked and burned alive uh, in Flanders. Um, this is a woodcut that was made about the time that Tyndale was killed, and it shows what eyewitnesses said were Tyndale's last words. Before he was choked and died, the last words on his lips was, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. Within less than 50 years, the English Bible was available in large print edition in every parish in England. So, what you have now are three branches of Christianity. Again, you move from the ancient church to the medieval church to 1054. Now it divides into the eastern church and the western church. And then out of the western church in the 16th century, you have Protestantism and then Roman Catholicism. So today, there are three major branches of the Christian church. Eastern Orthodoxy, Protestantism, Roman Catholicism. Uh, each of them have, uh, you know, their claims of authenticity and uh, historical continuity and so on. And some of the claims are a little odd. For instance, it may strike you as a little odd that most Eastern theologians consider Protestants to be closer to the Roman Catholic Church. But they came out of the Roman Catholic Church, so maybe that's part of it. But in any case, you have these three branches. Um, now, <clears throat> early Protestant traditions. Are you ready to take another break? No? Okay, I'll, I'll do this and then we'll take a break. Early Protestant traditions are going to include the Lutheran tradition, which is in northern Germany and Scandinavia. Denmark, Norway, Sweden. Primarily, these become state churches in these countries, okay? So pretty much, well, not everybody is Lutheran, but, but for a long time, pretty much everybody was, okay? In southern Germany, they're still mostly Roman Catholic, okay? So Germany, at least modern Germany, is kind of religiously divided into the north and the south. Uh, but in any case, the Lutheran traditions there, and then the Lutheran traditions, of course, made it, make it into uh, America across the pond, so that in America you have the Missouri Synod Lutheran, the Wisconsin Synod Lutherans, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, the um, uh, Apostolic Lutherans, uh, you know, various branches of the Lutheran Church that would be uh, here. Now, I'm not sure about, like, uh, Kona. Is there a Lutheran Church in Kona? Does anybody know? I mean, I don't really know Kona, so I don't know. Well, maybe it didn't make it this far west. I don't know. But anyway, um, I have uh, a number of friends, uh, particularly in the Missouri Synod uh, branch of the Lutheran Church, who are pastors and are friends of mine. Uh, once in a while, they actually let me preach for them, which is really unusual because Lutherans don't actually like it. Uh, wild outsiders like me to come in and preach. They rather rather keep things safe, you know, with people they know. But once in a while, I preach for them. Then there's a Reformed tradition. If the Lutheran tradition really goes back to Luther, the Reformed tradition really goes back to John Calvin and his followers. And primarily, this is going to be in the lowlands, like the Netherlands and uh, Luxembourg, France, Switzerland, Scotland, largely on the basis of the leadership of John Knox who is himself a follower of Calvin. So uh, the Reformed Church jumps across the, uh, you know, the channel, but mostly in Scotland. Whereas in England, it's going to be mostly the Anglican Church. Uh, but first, I better talk about the Anabaptists. Also in Germany, there are the Anabaptists in Germany, Switzerland, some in Scandinavia, some in the Lowlands. Now, what in the world is an Anabaptist? It's not a Baptist whose name is Anna. <laughs> well, I told you I had worse jokes. That's one of them. <laughs> okay. 
Really, the word Anabaptist means a rebaptizer. Because Anabaptists insisted on baptism by immersion to people who were old enough to cognitively confess the faith. So, whereas the Lutherans and the Reformed traditions continue to baptize infants by their parents, I mean, they're not. I mean, their parents bring them to be baptized, and their parents confirm, uh, you know, their faith, and that they will raise the child in the faith, and then the child eventually goes through confirmation and first communion and all that stuff. The Anabaptists say no baptizing babies. Only if you're old enough to confess the faith cognitively, and if you have been baptized as a baby, we will rebaptize you again. Okay, so they're called the rebaptizers. Now that caused a lot of distress because people that were actually Lutheran, if they got caught up with an Anabaptist group, they had to get baptized again. There was one particular occasion when uh, some, and this happened totally within Protestants. Some of the Protestants who actually believed in baptizing babies caught one of the Anabaptists who was rebaptizing people and they drowned him. They said, you wanted to be baptized by full immersion? This is it. And they let his body float down the river as a sign that they weren't in, uh, in the same, on the same page regarding baptism. So sometimes the debates about baptism were more than just gentlemanly differences. They, they got pretty serious about this kind of stuff. And then, of course, there is the Anglican Church in England and Wales, uh, which is probably of these the closest one to the Roman Catholic Church. Even though the Anglican Church adopted Protestant theology, they did not so much adopt Protestant worship forms. So if you go to an Anglican Church, you will find a lot of similarity between the worship style and a Roman Catholic Church. Theologically, they are Protestant, but in terms of style of worship, not so much. So, I mean, probably some of you come from all four of these, maybe. I don't know. Uh, do you have any questions or, or reflections or just observations about that? Yeah. Why do they take baptism so seriously? You know, I've wondered that myself. Because they... It, it doesn't seem like it ought to be an issue to divide everybody. Uh, but it, it, it certainly was that kind of an issue. And they were very insistent on it. Um, one reason, I think, is because of the respective theologies. For one thing, the people who baptize infants emphasize the fact that baptism is the New Testament counterpart to circumcision in the Old Testament. And circumcision was not for kids that were old enough to believe. It was for people who were eight days old. So if you belong to the covenant, then you baptize your children very soon after they're born as a sign that they belong to the covenant family. To then get rebaptized is a way of rejecting that. Those who baptize those who are old enough to confess their faith emphasize the passages in the New Testament that say believe and be baptized. So there's a link between faith and baptism. Those who baptize infants point to the passages where entire families were baptized in the book of Acts, of which probably some of those were babies. Were they baptized or not? I don't know. At least a couple of those passages say they were all baptized. So they, they each have passages they rely on, but why they are so insistent, sometimes to the point of war and death, uh, that kind of escapes me. I have to confess. Well... <laughs> Yes and no, because all of them agree that salvation is by faith alone. Baptism may be an expression of faith, but baptism is also a physical ritual. And none of them agree that you are saved by a ritual. You are saved by faith and by faith alone. So, again, it would seem to me that believing faith alone saves would then make them back off of some of the harshness that they treated each other in these respects. But for, for better or worse, they, they were pretty harsh about some of it. All right, let's take a break before we do the Calvinist-Arminian debate. Yeah. So just to 
couple of minutes, stand up and stretch.